Thank you all for joining us for the Federal Budget Review 2023. I'd first like to welcome our guests today. Um, we have Jason Kalija, who's a Senior Financial Advisor from FMD Financial. Jason will be sharing some of the uh, updates specifically from the budget, and we'll hear from him shortly. Um, we're also very fortunate to be joined by Jay Sivapalan from Janice Henderson. Uh, Jay is the head of Australian Fixed Interest, and so he'll be giving us a broader update on the uh, Australian market and uh, inflation and all of that sort of interesting uh, and very impactful uh, stuff. So, gentlemen, thank you very much, both of you, for joining me today. Jason, I'll go to you. Um, what was your impression overall of this budget? Thanks, that, Lee. Um, to be honest, there weren't really any surprises in the recent federal budget, given most of the proposals, as usual, uh, were leaked pre-budget night to sort of get a feel of how they would go down. Um, in saying that, we'll run through some of the key measures that were announced um, that may impact on FMD clients. Um, so if you go to the next slide, Lee, at a very high level, um, there were some announcements around superannuation and pensions, cost of living measures, um, home ownership and affordability for small businesses, older Australians, and then there's a few other areas worth noting that we'll jump into. So starting with the uh, $3 million total super balance tax, um, as it was pre-announced, there'll be an increase of the earnings tax from 15% to 30% incurred on total super balances and that includes both super and pension accounts. So it's important to be mindful of that. So in excess of $3 million from 1 July 2025, still a bit of time. Um, at this stage, the cap's not expected to be indexed, so it will affect more people over time, as especially those younger ones where their balances are growing. Um, in terms of the calculation, a super fund's taxable income is essentially irrelevant um, for the purpose of this, this calculation. Um, it's really looking at the movement in your total super balance over the year. Um, so it looks at the, I guess, the increase or the movement, then adds back in things like lump sum withdrawals and pension payments and excludes any contributions to ensure that the new money going in doesn't inflate any earnings. Now, what this approach means is that unrealised capital gains are captured in the earnings, which has received strong pushback from the industry. So the government's asked for some feedback and it's been, I think, given that feedback loud and clear over the last couple of months. And as a result, that method of calculation may change, but it's a bit unknown at this stage. Um, in terms of the process, so assuming that it all, all does go through and this tax comes into play, um, at this stage, it's expected it'll be similar to D Division 293 tax for high income earners, where after you lodge your tax return, the ATO sends out a notice advising the additional tax payable, and you can then elect whether to pay that from your super fund or pay that from your personal cash reserves. So if these changes ultimately affect you, your advisor will be in contact once legislation has been introduced to Parliament, with a bit more clarity around that, um, to let you know any potential implications and also if there's any recommendations you should take. Jason, we've got a question around that. And is does that super balance apply to each person or if perhaps you're in an SMSF and there's uh, one account, how would that apply? Yeah, that's a great question. So regardless of whether you've got an SMSF or individual accounts, it's per person. So for a couple, it would be having above $3 million each before that um, additional tax comes into play. Great. Thanks, Jason. All right. um, and look, there, there's likely to be some strategies that come from this, and that could be withdrawing part of your super, utilising a family trust, or investing in your personal name. So I think the estimates from the government around um, the additional tax revenue could generate might be overstated because, like all things, people adjust and find other ways to invest more tax effectively. Um, the other key measure was, um, it wasn't announced, but it was around the, the minimum pension requirements. So as some of you may be aware, um, there was a 50% reduction in the minimum pension requirement, which came into play in the 2020 financial year. And that was really due to COVID. Um, as a result of that, the no announcement around that, we are expecting it to go back to normal from 1 July, 2023. Um, so the standard payments, uh, minimum pension requirements are for those under 65, 4%. And for those 65 to 74, 5%, and then so forth, it goes up. Um, so the key message here is if you are currently drawing the minimum pension requirement um, from 1 July, it's essentially expected to double. So it's worthwhile if you do have any uh, queries around this, reaching out to your advisor to start planning for that. Um, another measure that was 
not announced in the budget, but which is a positive thing, is um, the transfer balance cap, which it doesn't really explain what it is in, in terms of the title, but it's essentially how much you can have in that tax-free pension environment within superannuation. So there was some speculation that the government may freeze this cap. Um, however, given it wasn't, wasn't announced, the transfer balance cap is, will increase from $1.7 million to $1.9 million on 1 July 2023. Now, for those that haven't used their full transfer balance cap, your cap will be indexed accordingly. And it's worth noting, it is prorated. So if you've used part of your cap, you don't get the full uplift from 1.7 to 1.9. Um, but it is worth noting, if you are considering starting a pension before 1 July 2023, it could be worthwhile holding off, um, say, an extra month or so. Um, so worth chatting to your advisor around any pension commencements you're looking at. Um, on another topic, so the cost of living measures, um, there was a bit in the, the budget around this, but I'll try and pull out the key ones. Um, so the government announced it'll be providing funding to reduce the impact of rising energy prices by um, providing targeted energy bill relief. So from 1 July 2023, pensioners, veterans, concession card holders, and those on government support payments can receive up to $500 in electricity, electricity bill relief which will be provided to those eligible um, through a reduction in energy bills. So in light of this and some of the other budget measure, measure announcements, um, if you're not currently a Commonwealth Seniors Healthcare Card holder or a low income healthcare card holder, it's definitely worth reviewing your eligibility. Um, and for more information around how to apply for these cards, we have prepared a guide called How to Manage Your Centrelink Benefits Online, which you can, be, which you can find on the FMD website under the Insights tab or even ask your FMD advisor and they should be able to direct you to that information. Um, in terms of home, home ownership and affordability, now I think as most people are aware, uh, it's a pretty big issue at the moment and it's only gonna become more challenging with migration levels increasing. Um, there's no simple solution for this and the government really announced a few measures which tinker around the edges. Um, one of the measures is expanding the eligibility for the various home buy guarantee schemes to really provide support for those with limited savings to purchase a home. So needing around a 5% um, deposit without getting the um, mortgage insurance. Now this, they've expanded it so it includes, it can be with a sibling, um, friends and other family members rather than just the partner. Uh, some other measures that were announced were around the Housing Future Fund, which is for affordable and social housing. And the other one is incentivizing the construction of more rental properties to take some pressure off the, the rental market. So it's worth noting um, that the Prime Minister also came out yesterday and advised he would not be re revisiting Labor's um, negative gearing policy before the next election, uh, because it was a bit of sort of heat that he was getting in the, the media around that over the last week or so. Um, so at this stage, it's nothing before the next election. So we'll wait and see. Before the next election, Jason. Exactly right. That's a key thing. <laughs> <laughs> mm. um, on the next slide, Lee, um, there's a few other budget measures. Um, so. On the small business front, um, there was a surprise announcement that was the reinstatement of the instant asset write-off up to 20,000. And this allows small businesses with turnover under 10 million to write off the value of new equipment installed or first used in the 2023-24 financial year. So this threshold will apply on a per asset basis. So small businesses can instantly write off multiple assets immediately rather than having to gradually depreciate them over time. So that's a win there. Um, for older Australians, there were a few budget announcements. The government advised they're aiming to provide, provide some cost of living relief through tripling bulk billing incentives for eligible patients. So that includes pensioners and other Commonwealth concession card holders. Um, on, the, on the home care front, the government announced they'll release an additional 9,500 home care packages next financial year, which is very much needed with more people wanting to stay in their homes whilst receiving care. And then in terms of aged care, the government is committed to fund the Fair Work Commission's recommended 15% increase in um, award wages for aged care workers from 30 June 2023. Um, and although no changes were announced around aged care fees, um, it was indicated that this may be reviewed when the new Aged Care Act is announced in 2024. So we'll have to wait and see there. Mm -hmm. um, and then touching on some of the other key measures or takeaways from the budget, uh, a positive one was around the stage three tax cuts that the previ previous government legislated um, some time ago. And that was sort of started in the 2020-19 financial year. 
and the third stage of the tax cuts due to take effect on 1 July 2024. So there has been a bit of speculation around whether the government would, let's call it, tinker with the, the stage three tax cuts, whether they delay it, modify it or cancel it altogether, um, given it does come at a significant cost to the budget. And it benefits particularly those high income earners who could save around 9,000 per annum of tax um, each year. So, but they haven't made an announcement. Now, look, it's worth noting there's another um, budget to go before that <laughs> officially gets through next year. Um, but mm. so far, so good around that. So we'll have to wait and see. But they did support it in opposition, Jason. So perhaps they'll be they'll be silent on that till the next election. Yeah, I think I think that's likely to be the case, but um, you just never know. So we'll wait and see. Um, and then finally, it's worth noting that the government did announce from 1 July 2026, so there's still a bit of time before this comes into play, that employers will be required to pay their employees the super guarantee, which is those 10.5% contributions at the moment, which is going up to 11% in July. Um, so they'll have to start paying them from 1 July 2026 at the same time as they pay the salary. So not waiting until the end of the quarter. They'll have to do that either weekly, fortnightly or monthly, depending on the pay cycle. Um, now, whilst this is, this is some additional administration for um, employers, it does provide some really key benefits for employees. Um, so it makes it a lot easier for them to track their super contributions, given it's the same time as their pay cycle. And by coming in more frequently, it gives them the ability to have that compounding effect of those funds being invested. So hopefully increasing the retirement nest egg. Um, and then the other one worth noting is that it should hopefully reduce the impact of when, unfortunately, some employers do go broke and then the employees are left with unpaid superannuation. So it should limit the impact of that going forward. So there's sort of the key measures um, from the, the recent budget announcement, Lee, um, that I've covered off on, and I'm sure we'll have some Q&A towards the end of the session to go through. Great. Thanks very much, Jason. Really appreciate you taking time to give us that update. Okay, Jay, over to you. I'm going to uh, hand over uh, the remote control to you and uh, I'll just forward on a couple of slides and uh, there we go. And then I'll hand over to you. Okay, uh, thank you. you should have, have you got control now, Jay? Um, I think you do. It does. Yes, thank you. Fantastic. Very much. Well, Jay, thanks again for, for joining us today. And uh, Perhaps I'll start with a question for you um, in, in terms of as a fixed interest manager, inflation is a pretty integral part of your considerations. Have we reached peak, peak inflation? Yes, very good question. And um, no, look, th thank you, Lee and Jason, and also uh, everyone online listening in today um, for having me on today. So uh, to give you a, a very quick answer, then I'll go through the detailed answer through the presentation. Um, we do believe that we've reached peak inflation and, it, and indeed consumer inflation is already showing quite good signs of coming down. However, wages inflation is the one that the Reserve Bank of Australia will be focusing on. And, and, and I think that's what will um, make this economic cycle a little bit different to what we've seen in the past, uh, because we have come from an unusual place of the COVID-induced disruptions uh, to a full employment story. Uh, which we haven't had in over 50 years. Um, so let me get started uh, with the presentation. Um, so what I'd like to do in the next few minutes uh, is really give uh, all of our listeners today uh, an insight into the way we're thinking about where we are in the economic cycle, um, what uh, your investments in various asset classes are doing in terms of their performance, and then I'll hone in on specifically uh, where the RBA may go from here, what it means for investors and what it means for asset classes like fixed interest, and then some areas to avoid because there are some risks around, uh, in particular in the latter stages of the economy cycle, and then there are some um, ongoing good opportunities. Uh, I think that the key message that I'd like to leave today is, you know, we do need to be more thoughtful and conscious about the way we invest in this part of the economic cycle. But that doesn't mean sitting in cash or that doesn't mean sitting in, um, you know, risk free assets. Um, there are good, relatively safe opportunities in the market. So at a high level, um, if I just move back one and hopefully this will work. Um, what we've got as a forecast this year 
of about 1.4% GDP growth. Now, that's that green bar that you can see on screen. And just to put that in context of last year, it's about, it's almost half of the economic growth. So where's that coming from? Why would the economy be slowing? Of course, that's all by design by the Reserve Bank of Australia. We are today operating arguably at above full employment, which generates that uh, inflation that the RBA is trying to control. And so it's really about slowing down the consumer. So the orange bars that you see on the screen are essentially what uh, the Reserve Bank is trying to contain. Now, what are the more pertinent areas within that? Um, if you look at the labour market, and in particular, I'll focus on the unemployment rate, about 3.5% today, which is the orange line, and the underemployment rate. Uh, this is really key. Uh, the underemployment rate is essentially when you're scraping the barrel to ask every individual, hey, um, you're currently working 20 hours, can you come in and work 25 hours? Uh, or could you could you please just do an additional shift or whatever it be, or uh, do some overtime? We're running out of people um, to do that. And it's quite timely that we are now getting that natural migration and population growth again, now that we've opened up properly for students and also business migration, professional migration. Uh, and that should see uh, the unemployment rate as well as uh, the consumer pulling back from tighter monetary policy cash rates, um, that unemployment rate heading back towards about four and a half percent. So the labor market remains very tight. Moving forward, um, where do we expect the slowdown to come from in our economy? It is all around the interest rate sensitive sectors. So if you walk up to a Harvey Norman or a Nick Scarley today, they are now telling us that they're starting to get some inventory overhang and some stock. You know that display home patronage um, has dropped quite considerably and home loan approvals have dropped quite considerably as well. Now, that's not to say that that is broad based. Uh, and that's where we need to be very mindful about not getting too cautionary uh, and or too pessimistic about the Australian economy because the non-interest rate sensitive sectors are actually performing well and should continue to perform pretty well. Um, we recently picked up some data right up to last week on toll roads, for example, in Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland, and that is showing month on month, quarter on quarter, year on year, and even a pre-COVID, post-COVID rise in traffic numbers. So the activity in the economy remains pretty uh, robust. And that excellent um, you know, analysis and, and, and summary by Jason earlier about the budget is if you look at it, it's not a pro-inflationary budget. It's all about a little bit of redistribution of equity and also dealing with some of the cost of um, you know, living pressures. Uh, and that should really uh, not be pro-inflationary and not cause the RBA um, too, too many headaches. So with that as a bit of a backdrop, um, what happened with investment markets last year? So last year, and I was fortunate enough to be invited on this panel last year and spoke with you uh, all for those returning um, guests. Um, it was a year of adjustment from pretty close to 0% cash rates to something materially higher than that, which we would consider quite normal. And of course, that required a repricing of a range of asset classes, uh, all the way from the property trust sector or REITs, shares, uh, even fixed interest, which is supposed to be a defensive asset class, and really it was only cash that performed well. Now, if you look at this year as a quick summary, uh, and this uh, data is about four weeks old, but nevertheless, you're seeing quite a different picture. Now, why is that? Because policy is quite tight. It's because a lot of the bad news has all already been incorporated into markets, allowing you know share markets and so on to push forward. Okay. Looks like we might have lost Jay momentarily. Um, we okay. might have lost you for a moment there, Jay, but I think we've got you back now. Okay, great. Um, now, I was just talking there. Uh, hopefully you can hear me all right now. Yeah. Okay, great. So I was just effectively summarising that, look, 2022 was when uh, risk assets like share markets and REITs and property trusts repriced downwards. Uh, whereas 2023, we're seeing a much better outcome. 
Now, when we look more specifically in the bond market and fixed interest, uh, everyone assumes that look, rising cash rates is bad for fixed interest and falling cash rates is good for fixed interest. But actually, the big driver of fixed interest is the 10-year government bond yield, which is in the blue line. And what you observe there is that typically markets run well ahead of the Central Bank or the Reserve Bank of Australia. So all those little orange circles are essentially periods where bond yields peak even in the early stages of an RBA tightening cycle. And thereafter, bond yields tend to plateau and go sideways, or if they've overshot, come back down. And this episode was no different. Bond yields last year peaked in the middle of last year, and those growth assets like equities and property trusts and infrastructure fell in value. Uh, whereas if you look at this year, bond yields have gone sideways, in fact, a little bit lower, uh, and those um, uh, growth assets have been much more resilient. And so this is just dislocating what might happen in the economy versus what's already priced into investment markets. So with that in mind, you know, one of the strategies that many of you are involved with, the tactical income fund, um, the two key decisions that we need to make on your behalf is when to be in cash-like or floating rate investments and when to invest in longer duration assets effectively to lock in better yields, and then when to be in risk-free assets like government bonds or when to lend money to companies um, you know, like Telstra and NBN and, and Woolworths and so on. So in relation to that first decision, uh, you know, the time to have really locked in those longer term bond yields was the middle of last year. And hopefully what you see on screen here in the orange uh, under label number two is that we were able to in the portfolio lock in those high yields, um, which is delivering now good outcomes for investors uh, this, this financial year. Today, uh, we're caught playing a much more cautionary view and we will look for that next opportunity when bond yields rise again to go and pursue those higher returns. Now, as I said, um, what we need to be mindful of as investors is where we are in the economic cycle. Now, what we don't know as investors is whether we're at 10.30 p.m. on a sort of a clock or at 11.59 p.m. Um, so there are ways we can nuance our portfolios. What we can all agree on, I hope, uh, is that we're in the second half of the economic cycle. We are now gradually entering or have entered tight monetary policy. We're no longer at neutral monetary policy. So there are some areas that are worthwhile just keeping an eye on in terms of our portfolios and exposures. Exposure to private credit, um, they typically tend to be lower credit quality investments, in particular around real estate construction at this moment in time. Um, you've all read uh, in the press, you know, many real estate construction companies going bust weak mortgages, now's the time to really focus on those areas, in particular the non-bank, non-conforming um, mortgages, what we call second lien loans. So, you know, pretend uh, a florist shop who uh, has borrowed money on their home, their primary residence, but then they go and borrow another $100,000 for their shop. Uh, that's called a second lien loan, uh, and we need to be cautious about those sort of areas. Um, higher yielding markets and loans markets. Now, as I said, that doesn't mean we avoid investing altogether and sit in cash. Indeed, there are some really good, safer investments where we can take bigger positions. One of those areas is investing and lending money to our states versus the federal government. Uh, when we lend money to our states, we get on average about 0.75 to 1% higher yields, uh, even though in real terms, they're, they're pretty equivalent in terms of total default risk. Um, the other area is corporate credit. Now, when we talk about companies, um, the chart that you're seeing uh, on screen here, think of this as the additional compensation. Uh, so the way to read this chart is if it says 200 basis points, it basically means an additional 2% to lending money to the government. Uh, and you can see there the orange line and the blue line, which is effectively our governments and our major banks like CBA, ANZ, Westpac. Uh, you're getting today quite well compensated for lending money. I mean, today we can lend to CBA or ANZ for five years. 
with a yield of about five and a half percent. Then you go to the lower credit quality assets. So let's say the triple B side, and you're probably getting about six and a quarter percent. So that extra yield for that lower quality today is not worthwhile, but we can uh, generate and enjoy five and a half percent type, you know, handsome yields uh, in a relatively safe way today. Um, now you'll be reading a lot in the press uh, about you know, commercial real estate and the debt attached to commercial real estate, in particular in the US and the US regional banks and some of the risks that are starting to form. Um, I just thought I'd put this chart up uh, for your benefit, just to differentiate that with the picture for the Australian REIT sector or the property trust sector. Uh, firstly, on the left-hand side, the orange line is the average gearing or leverage of American property trusts. The, uh, the charcoal line uh, on the left-hand side is the average gearing of our property trust here in Australia. So you can see already we're running about half the amount of leverage or debt in our property trust, especially the high quality end of you know, names like Dexas or GPT or vicinity centres. And they are prime, very hard to replace assets, um, strong town planning laws, high occupancy rates, and so on, especially with the population growth that we're having, um, that should all bode well for those types of assets. So whilst there are some scary, scary things going on offshore, and perhaps we may have some mark to market impact in Australia, from a permanent loss of capital, I think we can feel a little bit more secure in these areas. Um, the other discussion point that you'd all be reading about is this big fixed rate mortgage cliff uh, that investors are facing. And if you have a look at the right hand side, um, this is a timeline of the value of fixed rate mortgages and when they mature. And you can see, you know, as we're speaking here in May um, 2023, this is pretty much the peak month in terms of those fixed rate mortgage cliffs. So I'm sure. Okay. So is that investment investors and uh, homeowners? That's right. Yeah. So this is total. So all yep. uh, mortgages. Um, so investor and, and, and fixed and um, primary primary residents or principal rent. And if you have a look at uh, you know that that sort of outline, I mean, basically by about September October the bulk of the individuals who borrowed on a fixed rate basis uh, a couple of years ago uh, would have expired and then they're facing a materially higher interest rate and so this is where we do see the policy gripping uh, in Australia uh, now that needs to be taken into account that you know only one in three households have a mortgage to begin with one in three rent and one in three are fully paid off and then within that one and three that does have a mortgage, uh, it's roughly about 30% again who borrowed in the last two or three years. So individuals who borrowed, you know, eight, 10, 15 years ago, who are used to paying six, seven, eight percent type mortgages, um, it will be a root shock, but they will be by and large fine. What we're really worried about are in particular the first home buyers and newer buyers who really stretch themselves in the last two or three years, who borrowed vast amount of money in capital cities, uh, who are now facing effectively uh, a tripling in their interest rate and mortgage rate. And this will make it really hard for the Reserve Bank of Australia to tighten policy in the second half of the year, which I'll get to in a moment. But does this necessarily mean a crisis and will it be very problematic for our banks? Um, I guess after the GFC, you know, the whole motto around our banks is to make them unquestionably strong. And so the chart that I've put up here is effectively the total capital. Think of this as banks' abilities to absorb losses uh, for the, the top 20 or 30 banks around the world. And you can see on the far left-hand side, our big four banks in particular fare very well uh, in that uh, regard. So they're well positioned to deal with this um, fixed rate mortgage cliff that's coming up. And so it's our belief that the banking system will hold pretty well. And they are indeed working quite interactively with those uh, individuals who are stretched already. Uh, but the ultimate protection comes from where the labor market is today. Our base case is that the labor market moves from an unemployment rate 
of say three and a half percent to four and a half percent. Where we need to be worried about is if it gets to six and a half, seven percent type of unemployment because we will have bigger challenges. Now, I've spoken quite a bit about um, you know the the some of the challenges and risks that investors need to think about. Uh, but equally, once we get past this indigestion in the second half of this year around the real estate construction part of Australia, as well as this fixed rate mortgage cliff, the dynamics for Australia, in particular the elevated level of population growth, should actually bode quite well for economic activity into 2024 and 25. And that's why we'd rather focus on companies that may have some mark to market impact, but in reality, they are going to be the strongest companies and will come out on the other side as winners. And so what you see on screen are a variety of household names that you'd be familiar with. Um, in debt markets, we get access to you know, entities like NBN, uh, National Broadband Network, Monash University, Melbourne University, Port of Melbourne, which are not all in the listed market on the share side, but certainly available you know, paying today some very nice yields between five and seven percent, depending on their credit quality and tenor. So I guess just to pull all of my comments together, what we're focusing as investors is where are we in the cycle and what should we focus on? And that's everything on the left hand side. Consumer staples like Woolworths and Coles, core top four financial infrastructure like the senior bonds of ANZ, CBA, Westpac and NAB our universities who are really prospering with the reopening of our borders, a core social infrastructure, national affordable housing, NBN, lowly geared REITs that I mentioned earlier, inflation protected assets like toll roads, seaports, airports and financials. And what we're trying to avoid is everything on the right hand side. So those interest rate sensitive sectors like residential mortgage back, especially of those non-bank and non-conforming. We are now starting to see data where the arrears of mortgages generated by the broker community um, via the non-bank, non-conforming lenders is starting to rise quite sharply compared to the major banks, which is um, quite low. And then lower quality property trusts. Um, I did mention here bank hybrids, uh, and that's largely because in institutional markets, we're able to buy higher in the capital structure securities by the same banks paying the same margin or the same yield as these uh, bank hybrids. And then, of course, we've got some significantly challenged areas, you know, social license to operate like Crown and Tab Corp and so on, uh, will be uh, struggling going forward. So, Looking forward, um, what are we focusing on? As I said, um, just because we're in the latter stages of the economic cycle, which could take three months or it could take 24 months uh, before the next downturn, um, it doesn't mean that we sit in cash. It doesn't mean we sit and don't invest. Um, we can lock in pretty attractive yields today for investors in a defensive manner. Um, we do need to be mindful of you know, avoiding the temptation to buy lower quality credit for that last extra 0.25%. But we can take bigger positions in the safer segments of the market, AAA rated and AA rated high quality credit assets. Um, always a reminder, you know, for us having gone through the tech bubble and the GFC and WorldCom and Enron and European sovereign debt crisis, always focus on liquidity, don't underestimate it because at the time when you want to reallocate back into an overweight position to growth assets like equities and property, uh, you want to have that liquidity available. And today, really, um, the best chance of getting a good return is boosting our yields in the safer segments and, and remain patient. Thanks very much, Jay. Really appreciate uh, your input. And uh, I might um, ask now if there are any uh, questions and uh, perhaps while people are formulating their questions and typing them into the Q and A box, um, which you can access from the top of your screen. So I'll I'll start with one. So um, one of the words you haven't mentioned in in today's presentation, I don't think, is the word recession. Uh, what are we going to have one? Is this past? Is there? What's what's your view on the R word? Yes. Um, 
Look, recessions by their very nature are hard to predict and those left field events that cause a recession is hard to predict. But if we just focus on the fundamentals for a moment, um, yes, policy is tight and getting tighter in terms of the cash rate and, and mortgage rates. Uh, but that said, we are starting from a 3.5% unemployment rate and a whole bunch of activity in the economy that we need. Think about the healthcare sector, think about infrastructure building, think about our commodity story, uh, in particular with China committing back to a 5% growth rate. Think about the energy transition that we all need to make to electrify the world and so on. So um, I, I would say that our base case doesn't have a recession in mind. Uh, always in these latter stages of the economic cycle, uh, the prudent thing to do is have a base case uh, which doesn't have a recession in mind, but be prepared for one in the way you're positioning to not only avoid the downturn and, and, the, and the drawdown that occurs, but also to have capital ready to go and deploy um, should we have one. Um, certainly, you know, I spoke about that mortgage sector. We are patiently waiting in that mortgage sector on the sidelines, looking to deploy capital um, should we see some uh, dislocations there. Great. Thanks, Jay. Uh, we do have a question, and that question is about currency forecasts and perhaps uh, should we look at that AUD versus US or Euro? I'll leave that to you, Jay. Have you got a view? Yeah, so I think, you know, in terms of the currency, the, the most obvious one that individuals and, and investors look at is the US dollar, Australian dollar um, currency rate. But really, if you look at the trading basket for Australia, uh, between the commodity exports, between the educational exports, uh, between the agriculture exports, and then finally the uh, tourism and business services exports, it's a much more broader based um, basket. Arguably, the Australian dollar is being undervalued at the moment for the strength of the economy. And we, and that's largely because the US is further ahead in their cash rate tightening cycle than we are. Uh, you know, that, that they've got a good 100 plus basis points of cash rates. Uh, but if you look at where we are in our economy cycle, arguably the US is further ahead and uh, we will have more growth in relation to our trading partners and our trading basket. So you think that might see the Australian dollar appreciate over time potentially against yours? Yep. Yeah, that's right. Great. And Jay, you talked about our trading partners. One of our, our biggest, if not our biggest trading partner, I suspect is China. Um, what, do, you, do you have a view on what's happening in China and what how that might impact on, on the way you invest? Yes. Um, so purely from a internal uh, China-centric perspective, uh, I think where they are heading to compared to where they have been in the last 20 years is, you know, the last 20 years is all about getting those individuals from the rural areas into cities, building big cities and urbanising. And so when, when the GFC happened, they really used that as an opportunity to fast forward their infrastructure plans, property development plans, et cetera. And largely that has been successful. The, um, the, the, the negative side of that is they've built up a lot of debt in certain areas. Uh, this time around, they're shooting for more common prosperity. Uh, now common prosperity does not mean that you stop growing. And indeed they've, well, the recent commitment to a return back to a 5% per annum growth rate, whether they meet it, uh, whether they meet it exactly or not doesn't really matter. That's a moot point. But that's a pretty good growth rate for a very large economy. Now, that may not come purely from property and infrastructure and, and may come from a more balanced area. Um, and I think if you think about now looking back out to Australia, provided we continue to play our cards well and contribute, contri continue to be a net exporter to China, um, it should bode very well for Australia as a nation. And I think the discussions, um, quite healthy discussions of more recent times on our export basket and in particular, remember wine, barley and some of those commodities uh, or, or agricultural products. Uh, I think if we can get that back on the agenda, it'll be very good for us. Great. All right, so well, we're just about at time and uh, I don't have any more questions. So we might wrap up here. 
And uh, let me thank, uh, first of all, Jason Collegia for your update on the budget and Jay Sivapalan for your uh, broader economic update and update on the fixed interest market. Thank you both very much for joining me today. Uh, as a reminder to all attendees, we really welcome your feedback. You should receive a short survey after this session and uh, we'll also make the session available on video and it should be on FMD TV in a few days as well. So thank you all very much for joining us today and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.